All right, time to sum up elliptic curves. So we have now seen um, pairings as an attack tool, but also as a constructive um, building block. And so let me summarize what are the other attacks which are specific to elliptic curves. So we've been saying so far, well, we only have generic attacks. Then I showed you pairings, which are not so generic, except for, for most elliptic curves. They do not give you an attack for most elliptic curves. Pairings are a transfer from a discrete log problem to a much, much harder discrete log problem. And so are there any other classes of elliptic curves where it's scary? So you seem to have a singular curve is something scary. We have seen that we have to watch for the embedding degree. And so what else do we have to watch for? So there's one class called anomalous curves. Now, anomalous sounds even more special than super singular and is, well, more special indeed, because um, anomalous means that the number of points over fp is p. So it was p plus 1 for the super singular curves for large finite fields, and anomalous curve has p points. And if you happen to have a curve where the number of points over fp is p, then you can transfer the set of points or the discrete log problem in the set of points, so it's a transfer which is a homomorphism, to, oops, the additive group over fp. So this is even worse than what we've seen before. This has a very, very easy discrete log problem. What we had before is it maps to an extension field to fpk, and it's at least the multiplicative loop there. And there we have an mixed calculus attack, which can make this map to something which is easier. Well, or if you're a constructive person, you can say, well, I want to balance the sizes. Here, there's no escape. If you happen to fall onto an anomalous curve, you do. This is just bad. There's no silver lining. There's no nice thing you can build from this, unless your target is all building a weak system or doing a capture the flag exercise. That's basically the best thing you can do with an anomalous curve. There's something a bit more exotic, which is called veil descent. And it needs a lot of math, which we haven't seen yet. So I'm going to throw some words at you, um, and you'll notice instantly that it's happening in a situation that is not the situation that we are in. Namely, it starts with an elliptic curve not over fp. All my lecture has been over for elliptic curves over fp, except for now with the super singular curve. Sorry, with the uh, pairings, I looked at super singular curves over larger fields to show you that super singularity implies small extension degree, uh, embedding degree, no matter what. And now veil descent, I'm looking at fp not just to one power, but m and n. So if you have something, and look the curve over an extension field, and this extension field is composite, then this map called veil descent allows you to map from the points of elliptic curve, the discrete log problem there, to the discrete log problem in some algebraic geometry thing, which is called a variety over R. So this is now a field fp to the n. So we lost the, so we have fp, we have fp to the n, uh, n and we have fp to the mn. So we lost one degree, so it's, there's an n, m that is gone. But instead of having a curve, we're having a variety. So that's a higher dimensional object. So this j there, it would be nice. It's very efficient to compute on varieties that are Jacobians of curves. Now, in general, if you land on a variety, you can always reasonably express your elements as polynomials of some bounded degree. In particular, there's some degree which depends on this m. And so if m is intermediate size, it's not just two or something, but if it's intermediately large, so that you have a low degree of your polynomials, but you can also define lower degrees, then you can mount an ace calculus attack. Remember how I showed you for fine fields with small characteristic that you have uh, index calculus by using the polynomial representation of your fine field and then a factor base of polynomials of lower degree. And so that's also what happens here with veil descent. For this j, you can define a factor base which has a representation with polynomials of very small degree, say degree 1. And then you can look at elements of j which have a degree with this representation factors. Okay, lots of stuff. Sounds scary. It is scary, so don't use those fine fields. But just to push you a little bit further, 
um, this can be an attack if this variety doesn't have too large damage. So if this blows up again, then you haven't actually gained anything. So you have some wiggle room, you can use these fine fields if you really, for whatever reason, must. Uh, but it is sort of uncomfortable. Now if you're an attacker, you want to actually push this to something where you can attack better. So what is the nicest situation that you can hope for? Um, this arithmetic and also the index calculus gets most powerful if this j is the Jacobian of a hyperloptic curve. And well, given that my domain name is hyperloptic road, I had to show you something about hyperloptic curves. So that's the, the deeper reason for having very descent in this course. So don't worry, it's not going to be on the exam, but I at least want to show you once the word hyperloptic in this course. So if you have a genus G hyperloptic curve, to motivate a little bit what genus means, so an elliptic curve is the curve of genus 1. The nice hyperloptic curves that we use in practice have genus g equals 2. And it gets slightly scary once g equals, reaches 3 or larger. The number of points on a hyperloptic curve of genus g is p to the g. And so you're having generic attacks running in p to the g over 2. And so this is an attack. Well, this thing here is an attack as soon as this exponent is larger than g over 2. And that means, well, g would have to be larger than 3. Okay, lots of scary words. Um, summary of a text is anomalous curves are really, really scary. They're descent. Well, you have an easy way to avoid it by not using composite fields. Um, there's a lot of math involved in it, but you um, can relatively easily understand how it works and where you land and then just excluded by using fine fields. So what are the security requirements? I said at the beginning, well, you as a designer actually have the power to choose an optic curve. So what do you want? You want to have a curve over a prime field. So I'm just flat out rejecting any extension field so we don't have to deal with real descent. Then we want to have that the number of points on the curve is almost prime. So we want to work in a prime order subgroup and the subgroup should be not losing too many bits. So we want to have that p is about the same size as l and um, the column for the near future security, we want to have 256 bits because we're always dealing with these square root attacks. So we need to have 2 to the 128 bit, uh, 2 to the 128 security. Now I want to accommodate Edwards curves and I want to accommodate somewhat a little bit more. So I'm allowing a power of two here as a cofactor, but I don't want to lose more than three bits. And this is the point where you have a little bit more jiggle room. So you can either say, no, I'm a diehard. I only want prime order. Or you say, well, I can actually handle, say, cofactors up to 12 or something. You can have a factor of three there. You definitely want to have that your curve is ordinary. So you do not want to have super singular curves. Unless you know that you want to do pairings, if you're just doing security requirements for elliptic curve cryptography, and mind you, this is lecture 13 on ECC, so it's not a pairings lecture. Um, so you do not want to have that your number of points is p plus 1. And you don't want your curve to be anomalous. anomalous. So you don't want that number of points being p. So these cases are all requirements if you want to have the elliptic curve discrete log problem is hard. We just set up a curve a page about curves and well, what you want to have when you're choosing curves called, called safecurves.cr.yp.to and that actually lists a few more properties. I mean, you might have thought that bail descent was already exotic and I agree with you, it's pretty exotic, but there's also something about the discriminant of the CM field, which I felt like, well, I shouldn't put on the sh on slide here. It's another thing that is extremely unlikely to apply if you have a randomly chosen curve, but it's something you should check. And so for all the properties that we would recommend to check, you can find them on the curve and uh, on this page. And we're also recommending to be concerned about implementation security. So that is the feature of, well, how likely are you going to get your implementation right? Are you going to have security issues with side channel attacks? Also, what is the origin of your curve? Is there any explanation for those parameters? I had mentioned that uh, NIST posted some curves and that, for instance, NIST P256 is pretty commonly used for applications, but there is no origin given. And 
the best we know is that Jairus Lunas, employee at an NSA, is one of the creators of these curves. And yes, there's a little bit of a story of how these parameters are chosen. So these are curves where a4 is minus 3 and a6 is such that it's the hash of some number. But as we show on this web page, um, you have actually some flexibility. So we define the notion of rigidity in order to um, quantify how much of an explanation there is. Now, we also had some fun coming up with ways to do this as the dark sider. So we have the white paper for the black hat. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you have found an attack on elliptic curves and want to cook up a curve to hide your attack and then sell it with the best arguments. I'll put the link on the course page. Uh, this is the end of the elliptic curve part. Thanks.